you're here hopefully because you want a little bit of story time about the DevOps training program that I founded and some advice on how you could potentially apply a similar curriculum and do something like this yourself. So I'm Emily Dunham. Here's how to get a hold of me. Um, these slides are up on my site and they will be at that URL for as long as I have that domain, which should be a very long time. Um, if you're looking at the slides online, hit Control C to see the notes that go with them. Um, so basically what we're going to talk about today is a bit of story time about what, what we did and how it worked, a bit of analysis as to why it went that way, and then a bunch of recommendations as to what I would do differently and how I would do it if I were doing this all over again. So this all started in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, I'm a I was for five years a computer science student at Oregon State University. Um, I tend to end up accidentally in charge of things. I, was, um, I did robotics in high school and then moved on to do robotics at OSU and ran the Linux users group there and was a teaching assistant as well. So I had some very convenient connections um, that I was able to leverage when I started this program, both through the Linux users group and through knowing how to organize events with the robotics club and then also through the OSU open source lab where I worked. So the OSU open source lab um, provides hosting for hundreds of open source projects. Uh, we provide FTP mirrors in uh, Corvallis, New York, and Chicago for many um, distros and packages. You've probably downloaded something from us at some point. We host the Apache Software Foundation, Drupal, that kind of thing, um, and do some software development as well. The open source lab is actually what really got me started um, contributing to open source. So I almost didn't get involved with open source software at all. When I was a freshman at university, I was basically just a robotics nerd, used Linux a bit totally as an end user. I'd show up to the Linux users group just to kind of get my problems solved, um, find out about cool new tools. But I didn't think I could contribute back upstream. It's like, that's for, that's for really good coders. That's for like kernel hackers. That's not for people like me. Um, however, I got really fortunate, attended an event, found out about the open source lab, applied for a job there, and got it because um, I had four more years left of school and um, the OSL really likes hiring people um, early in their academic careers as well as having done well on the programming projects that I'd done for school. So um, I started out as a software developer there, eventually si um, switched to the systems administration side. Um, the Open Source Lab was founded in 2004, and it, at that point it was basically a student-driven organization. It's grown a lot since then. We have about um, generally three or four full-time employees, um, both on the software development and systems administration sides. And it used to be just um, tucked under the umbrella of network services that provides internal solutions to the university. Now, what really got this DevOps bootcamp thing started um, so, oh yeah, other stats about the open source lab. We tend to have about 20-ish students who work part-time, about full four, time, uh, four full-timers. Um, we had these major transitions. Uh, we were moved into the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And this means that we're becoming a more academic type unit. Um, this is in 2014, um, late 2013 kind of thing. Um, we're becoming a more academic unit. All of the full-timers, are saying, oh man, we need to reach out to 100 students a year, we need to broaden our reach, we need to give other people the skills that these 20 students a year working at the OSL are getting. And at the same time, they're busier than ever. Um, no way are any of these full-timers really going to have time to put together a program like this. So School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science is like, yeah, we want to reach hundreds of students per year. We want to have more outreach, more teaching, and everybody's incredibly busy. This is a screenshot of my calendar for school on top of the who's scheduled where at work calendar around the time that uh, this was all happening. The full-timers are trying to coordinate all this. They, if we wait for them to have free time, we're going to wait until they retire, and I don't know if they'll ever retire because they like it so much. So I started thinking about what can I as a student do? And started brainstorming with some other students there. What could we do to give more students the opportunities that we've had? Um, 
we're talking about a bunch of different ways that we could potentially fix this. We talk about this op school curriculum that's online. It's a great thing hosted on Read the Docs. Um, check it out if you haven't already. But we're like, no, this is teaching really old school ops. This isn't what we do. This isn't what gets us our jobs and our internships. They need something more kind of developer focused. We look at some um, developer curricula and we're like, no, these don't really teach hands-on skills. These don't really put the ops side of stuff into perspective. So uh, we had a student who'd been an intern from Portland State University that summer who had participated in a program that they call the Brain Dump. Now, the computer action team up at Portland State was um, a branch of their network services division. They have this year-long training program that meets once a week, gives students an opportunity to do hands-on things with, their, um, with some toy computers and some um, more critical production machines as they kind of level up through it that's mostly student-driven. And its goal is to turn a student from a newbie who's kind of interested into a useful employee of their information services department. So we said, hey, we could do a similar thing. Again, we also looked at op school, but it was really old school, like just let sysadmin. Um, it also tends to be walls of text, often walls of please fix this and write the text. Um, and doesn't have really hands-on exercises or a way to get people the real experience that will get them those internships. So we're thinking, how can we combine all this? What do we want? Oh yeah, fun fact, op school sends you cookies if you get a dozen contributions in. Just thought I should mention that for all of you uh, knowledgeable ops people out there who might want to contribute. So we're like, let's start, let's start a class of our own. Um, let's learn from all of these different things and pull it all together. So. There used to be a class in Linux Systems Administration taught at OSU, and at the time that we founded Boot Camp, it hadn't been taught in years because nobody had time to teach it. It used to be my boss, but then he got hugely busy. He got promoted to director and so forth. Um, the curriculum from there was actually licensed um, Creative Commons non-commercial share alike, so we had that to draw on as well. And so we, we really analyzed the situation, analyzed our target audience of students who haven't started yet in open source. Students who are like, it would be cool to do that, but I just don't know where to start, or I can't start for whatever reason, who just had some excuse that we could potentially help them overcome and they'd be a totally fine contributor. Um, so we have an audience of total newbies. Rather than saying, we want to make sysadmins, or we want to make IT people for the Portland State University School of Engineering, we say, we want people to have the background they need to contribute to an open source project and fully understand the stack that they're looking at there. Um, we figured, let's teach DevOps. It's effectively infrastructure as code. Yes, it's buzzwordy, but buzzwords will help us get support. Um, we basically had to do it as an extracurricular because nobody certified or qualified to teach a full-time class that's part of a real curriculum and all the credit and all that has any time to do it. And one of the prerequisites for a student succeeding is going to be that they care enough about it to put a bit of time in. So we figured we would select for the people who are likely to succeed by um, giving a darn, by having an extracurricular. We wanted it to be really hands-on. And there's basically this, this deal. We will give you training. We will give you materials to study from. We will give you our expertise at your disposal. But in exchange, if you want to succeed from this, you're going to need to put some extra effort in. You're going to need to care about what you're doing. You're going to need to show up and learn from us. So with that out of the way, we're like, let's have this training program. It can go a full year. We can write the curriculum. We don't even already drafted some curriculum. We had this huge roadblock. What the heck do we call this thing? So. It turns out naming things is really hard, especially for engineers. Naming things is really hard. We need something that's descriptive, that's Googleable, that's roughly unique in the problem space, and that doesn't sound like terribly unprofessional, and that isn't a mile long. We argued back and forth a lot about this. This was a surprising sticking point, and we ended up calling, um, calling it, at my boss's suggestion, DevOps Boot Camp. Everyone who knows what they're doing kind of cringes at it because buzzword, buzzword. But at the same time, I can walk up to you and say, I found it at DevOps Boot Camp, and you know immediately roughly what I taught. Um, so 
at this point, we just started bringing the idea to our bosses. We actually, one of the full timers was a very, um, I'll just go with pessimistic sort of person. And we knew that if we brought an unfinished idea or an idea with no proof that it could really be done, that he would just shoot it down completely and try and prevent us from doing it again in the future. So to route around that potential damage, we got the first few lessons of curriculum pulled together based on brain dump type material, based on op school material, and based on CS312 material, and showed that to our boss going, hey, look, we made this thing. Do you want it? Rather than, may we make this thing? So with that, we ended up with DevOps Bootcamp. Um, so we centralized a site. Now that we had a name, we can start putting it on the web, devopsbootcamp.osuosl.org, and it's still there. Um, we wrote out our mission and our goals and our target audience early on in the process, and we found ourselves referring back to that quite frequently when we were refining what was going on. Um, we wanted it to be easy to keep under version control, easy to share, and easy to make it pretty, so we used restructured text and Sphinx. This is Read the Docs um, that's rendering everything for us. You can use a tool called Hieroglyph to render a Sphinx page into a slideshow, which is actually what I've used for this. And that helped us a lot because we didn't have to rewrite our curriculum between the slides and the easier to use online format. So then it was time to really figure out exactly where do we jump in on this whole curriculum thing. Yeah, they're going to need to know text editors and version control and configuration management and how, where everything lives on a Linux box so that you can use your configuration management well. But those are all interconnected. You have this circular dependency of knowledge of, OK, I can text teach you how to use a text editor, but how will you know why you care about text editors until you've had to work with config files? But then we can't really work with config files until we've talked about the services we're going to configure. And we can't really talk about the services until you know about Linux. And we can't really go too much into depth on the basics of Linux without dragging um, configuration into it. You just find yourself going in a loop. So the way that we worked around this is by, we just picked a place. We're like, let's start with teaching them about Linux. Um, one of my goals in structuring the curriculum the way we did was that we expected people to kind of drop out through the year. They might realize it wasn't for them. They might get swamped with too much schoolwork. And the goal was that after you, even if you just attend one lesson, you'll be better off in a computer science related career than if you never had. So we tried to build it up that way. And the exact curriculum is up there on the site. And we've been refining it through the second year of the program as well. So. Um, some logistical details, we live streamed it via Google Hangouts on Air because we had Google Apps accounts for OSL accounts. And it's generally pretty easy to set up. We discovered that you really want to have a single machine that you always stream from because getting logged into the right accounts and so forth is a mess. Um, we couldn't find a particularly good um, open tool that would let us screen share on any distro and um, publish it easily and live stream the way that Hangouts does because it's already set up for us. Um, and so you need, you should ideally have a single bootable USB stick that has just everything that you're using. Your logged in um, Google Plus account with your Hangout permissions all ready for you, your web browser that Hangouts plugins are installed for, a w the working virtual machine that you're going to be doing demos in, all of the slides, and the ability to talk to the projector. Um, if we could have gotten that together, it would have saved us a lot of problems um, along the way. And then we had to really balance our time management. We had to balance both for our students, um, how much can we reasonably expect them to do on top of school. And we had to balance between how much dev stuff versus op stuff should we teach, how do we combine this to get them the motivation for why we care about having our infrastructure as code? Um, and how do we keep it interesting and engaging for people of wildly different backgrounds? So we basically solved most of these problems by just constantly evaluating what we were doing, constantly trying to be like self-aware of how we were teaching, of how the students were progressing, and soliciting feedback from them a lot. Um, we would meet every week to analyze how things were going, assess whether we needed to put a review or catch up meeting, which we ended up needing surprisingly often since new students would try to trickle in throughout the year. And 
our curriculum wasn't set up to handle that very elegantly at first. Um, ultimately though, the hardest thing was probably time management. Um, it's hard for us, it's hard for the students. Um, we as the organizers were also students and also balancing lives and stuff and I can't think of any organizer who wouldn't be juggling a real job or a life or anything else. So I found that it helped the students to, for us to have really clear expectations and send them emails on just a regular basis that would say, here's what we did last week, here's what we're doing this next week, here's what you should catch up on if you're falling behind, here's when the next catch up day will be kind of thing. Um, helping the presenters with their time management since we had people from the community and open source lab teach lessons as well. Um, we would communicate with them about how long is it going to take you to get, this, um, to get your slides together. Okay, when can I remind you to come rehearse it with us? Um, and we would try to get the schedule together as early as possible so we could shift things around if somebody had a family emergency couldn't show up. Um, and I found that as the main organizer, my own time management was just critical to not going insane. And the way I did that was having a really organized calendar, just never trying to remember a deadline in my head, just it always goes on the calendar, including remind such and so about the thing or send the weekly email. And that just takes down the background noise of organizing something like this and makes it sustainable for even a year. And breaking up the really big tasks into little tasks that have a dedicated time for them worked really well for me. So the results were that we had about a dozen students um, go through during that first year. Then we formed, at the start of the second year, a day-long program we called DevOps Day Camp to roll the first few lessons into one. Um, we had over 100 students show up to that. We had two tracks, a newbie track and an advanced track. And we have the entire curriculum up on our YouTube with the lessons that we've taught on it. And we'll get people dropping into the IRC channel just say randomly saying hey thanks for that curriculum it was interesting and we've never heard of them they're not from our area they just happened to find it online so that's super cool um, Is that public oh yeah um youtube um osu open source lab if you search it on youtube um you'll find the videos um also devopsbootcamp.osuosl.org and if you go to the curriculum page it'll have video links along with slides links for every lecture so we found that what half to two-thirds of the students tended to drop throughout the year. More students trickled in, but based on the numbers that CAT's um, brain dump program had, we felt that like we'd be successful to have any students at the end of the year, and we did finish that first year pretty strong, and the second year it's going along well too. We had slightly fewer students start it at the beginning of the second year, but attendance has been pretty good as we've gone along. Um, we found that earlier in the year, we would put more time into preparing, and then as time went on, um, just life catches up with you, and it's harder to devote that time to preparing lectures as well. So some other results that we've gotten from this are really good pu publicity for the Open Source Lab for the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, which in turn motivates people from them to help us out with the program. Um, We've had a lot of students get the opportunity to speak, and that's improved their confidence. And a lot of them have gone on to speak at other conferences, just teaching tools that they've worked on. So I'm really proud of their achievements there. Um, it makes a better employment pipeline for the OSU Open Source Lab, because often companies will ask for students to recruit as interns, and there just aren't enough OSL students. But now we have this buffer that we can point them at and say, hey, some of these students have had the basic skills training, have taken the initiative, gone off and worked on an open source project, and they would be um, promising candidates for you as well. And then we've also fully documented everything because I ran it very hands-on, very directly the first year. It was, it was basically my baby. It was the amount of work I would have put into a senior project if I'd taken that class. I actually put that class off so I'd have more time for it. Um, and then the second year, I knew I would be leaving. And so I handed it off to some students who actually took the class the previous year, mentored them through, walked them through it, helped them refine all the checklists that I'd made, and now it's running without me. And I would say, as I'm going to get into, as I give you the advice part of the talk, that that's, that type of workflow is probably going to be critical to keeping it sustainable through multiple years. Because running it for a year, 
is exhausting and does put you at risk of burnout even if you don't have a lot of other classes and stuff going on just because there's so much uh, so many things to coordinate and so also having frequent handoffs of leadership forces us to document everything really well because you're not only documenting it for yourself you're documenting it for the next people and you're likelier to be nicer to them in the docs you write than you would care to for just you so um, does anybody have questions about what we did, how we did it, why we did it, before I get on to um, kind of digging into the results and how I would apply it in another setting? Yeah. Um, so you talked about like how with your presenters you would like remind and rehearse mm -hmm. them like what they would do. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming these presenters are kind of like in within your own organization? So it would really depend. We had. Um, it would depend on the topic, basically. So we outlined the curriculum for like, okay, this week we should teach the basics of version control. This week we should teach the basics of configuration management. Okay, week after basics of configuration management, we can have somebody who's, who wrote the book on Puppet and lives in Portland come down and give them a talk. That kind of thing. Okay. Um, so I would say it's probably maybe a third just the organizers giving a rudimentary skills talk that kind of anyone who's been a few years in the industry could give. Um, but maybe quarter of it would be um, full-timers from the open source lab or professionals in the very local community coming in to talk on a specialty of theirs and a bit more of it would be out-of-town people coming in like we had Case Cook come down from Intel to talk about security to us because um, we had we have friends who know him that kind of thing it tends to be just within the OSL's network although it's a very um, wide-reaching network in the area yeah, any other questions before I go on to analyzing and applying all this? Nope, okay. So, some of the things that I found afterwards, um, we had a surprisingly diverse group. Like, we would have much closer to the representation of various groups in the surrounding community than a computer science class would, and a lot of that was because we said it's open to complete newbies. All you need is interest in this and the willingness to put in some time and learn from us and ask questions. There is no barrier to entry. Um, fortunately, generally the kind of people who would just suck all of your time and not really catch on at the rate that you'd hope would tend to get frustrated and drop relatively quickly. But we had a lot of people from, who are from groups that are underrepresented in computer science um, come through the program. and so. Um, that, that was really nice. I think by not putting that, you need to think you're good at computers bar in place, um, we really managed to open it to everybody. Um, it's hard to measure the impact of it because we've, so students who took the program the first year are now leading it the second year. Students who went through the program have gotten jobs at the open source lab and internships in the community um, and local tech community. But at the same time, we don't really track students. Um, we thought it would be kind of creepy to try to track everybody. Um, so we can't really say how their lives, how the lives of the people who didn't decide, yeah, open source is for me, may be different. But um, I would think that anyone with a bit of a background in scripting, the knowledge that you can solve these problems with code is likely to be better off. Um, We've moved into the second year and did that kickoff with the day camp program. It was really surprising how many more people were willing to show up to a thing that's only a one day commitment than a longer term one. And we managed to get a whole lot of information across. We got about the first um, three or four lessons of the boot camp into that day camp. So if you're trying to figure out what form factor will give you the best um, like just attracting the audience, lower commitment things tend to work well. Um, also, people really like trickling in through the year. It's surprisingly hard to get people to just commit to a full year of something. Uh, we had practically a different group at the end than at the beginning, so we needed a lot more catch-up days than we'd anticipated. And we found that since most of our uh, students were um, students at university, it just wasn't reasonable to ask them to show up and do things during midterms week, during finals week, during breaks. So we kind of 
recalibrated our timeline based on our audience there. So with that, let's say that you're at a company or you're at a user group or you're at a university. You want to do something like this. There's some niche in the tech ecosystem that you're like, I wish we had a bunch more people who had those skills. And you want to do a boot camp type program. So if I were doing this again, um, first off, figure out exactly who you're targeting. Our target was community members, which happens to be mostly students because it's a college town. Very broad, um, makes it both easier and harder to target marketing at them. Um, but I would say you should target a group that an organizer remembers having been in. So at that point, I was a sophomore in, a junior in university. I remembered what it was like not to know how to code. Um, that let me really kind of empathize with and understand what the audience was going through, whereas if I were to start something for total newbies now, I would need to spend a lot of time just consulting with somebody who's newer because I've forgotten a lot about what it's like to just be learning things for the very first time. And the other thing is figure out what their goals and resources are. Goals could be I want a high paying job, could be I want to refurbish this um, broken old computer, could be um, I want to make friends. And their resources include money, time, transportation. Time is probably the biggest one. Um, what, if any, computers they have at their disposal, and, uh, and so forth. So once you have an audience in mind, find your supporters. This one was a no-brainer for me because the open source lab just intrinsically supports this kind of thing, especially if we're not asking the full-timers for very much of their time for it. Um, these might be community members, might be um, local user groups, it could be businesses that are trying to hire and find that there's a pipeline problem, um, and figure out what their goals and resources are. Are they, are they interested because they're hiring? Are they interested because they're formed for the purpose of increasing diversity? Are they interested because they're academic institutions and they like it when people teach things? Um, or just maybe if you have retirees in your area, are they bored and want to volunteer? It could be just about anything. And then their uh, resources that they might be able to share with you include money, um, buying you pizza, loaning you a space to meet in, um, as well as time and effort of humans. So also identify your own goals and resources with this. You can, you can basically kind of make a big old matrix. Like, I'm an engineer. I like spreadsheets. You can figure out whether it looks likely to work or whether you're going to have to adjust some goal or other of the program, adjust where you're trying to do it, adjust who you're targeting, to make it so that what you have at your disposal in terms of people hours, in terms of space, in terms of money if you're going to need it, um, in terms of people willing to do marketing for you to get you an audience to begin with, are going to align with what people really want. So once you've got a feel for what people would say if you ask them for some help or if you ask them to come be a student, you've got to figure out what you're asking them to do. Naming things is hard. You want it to be um, Googleable. Like, you, you want to be able to search it. I mean, naming, let's say, a plugin um, patchwork and then searching for it, you're going to find quilting supplies, and that's just obnoxious. Um, especially since you're newbies that you're targeting. If you're targeting the complete newbie, often won't have as um, the level of Google skills yet that you would expect from your peers. Um, the name should be unique for the space. Like, there's already a bootcamp DevOps, and if we called ourselves that, or like if we called ourselves Code School or Ops School, we would have been stepping on somebody's toes and causing massive amounts of confusion. Um, your name should also not be a jerk. It should not be, it should not make people uncomfortable in whatever way. If you have, um, there's, there are many, many ways that a person could be a jerk. There are many, many ways that a name could be a jerk. Let's say it sounds really awkward to say. Like, there's, I was talking about this at breakfast, and a friend brought up the name of a tool. It's called, it, it merges PHP and Puppet. It's for building VMs. It's called P-U-P-H-P-E-T, which we think is pronounced um, Puppet. But you have to be really careful with that. So don't do that in your naming. Um, it should be pronounceable 
as in people will say it the same way. Like XKCD is good this way. You can pronounce it, you can spell it how it's said, it's unique, versus um, GIF, which really is the correct pronunciation, but I'll start a holy war on that. I'm getting nods and glares, and I'm really glad that you didn't get to buy that vendor booth that has the little uh, foam rocket things, or we'd be having a more interesting video. Um, so yeah, you want it also to be descriptive, and you probably want it or an acronym that makes sense of it to be short. Um, even DevOps Bootcamp is kind of too long because the URLs get really nasty. Um, if it's really long, but you can have a nice short URL thing for making short URLs and you can buy that domain, that's pretty cool too. Um, but yeah, be careful of the name because once you've committed to one, it's really hard to change it. And also at this point, define the expectations. Do this before you have official sponsors. Do this before you have official users. Do this before it's an official thing. And then you won't have to work with um, all of the pushback against, but why would we need to add a code of conduct or any of that? Um, one code of conduct that I would recommend including for um, an educational type setting is the hacker school manual. They have a lot of suggestions of how to avoid kind of alienating people. They have rules like no but actuallys, like maybe, oh, I've got the server running, looks at your server. Huh, that is running, but actually you did this, this, and this wrong. There's, there are a few faster ways to alienate and discourage a newbie. And I assume that your goal is to have people succeed in this program. Um, also have just a general code of conduct. The ADA initiative has a blog post there with a big pile of links for how to do it. This is not only protecting anyone who might have unacceptable behavior happen to them, it's protecting you if some allegations of unacceptable behavior come up by defining a framework and a way for handling them. Um, and they're things that you might never need, but if you need them, you'll really, really wish you'd put them in place way sooner. Um, you can also just have your little disclaimer like the end user license agreement that nobody reads except encourage people to actually read them. It'll make them nicer people saying, yeah, by participating in this, yeah, by showing up, yeah, by volunteering for it, I agree to abide by these. And that'll make it easier to get any trolls out if you accidentally get them in. Um, somebody will hate your name. I'm, I'm sorry, but naming things is hard. We named it DevOps Bootcamp. That's a, that's a cool name, right? Nobody would dislike that name. No, a year later, some guy shows up on Twitter and goes, wow, Bootcamp sounds so militaristic. It would be such a nice program if it weren't for that. And it's just like, okay, rule of the internet there. Um, the best fix for that is kind of offering them something that they can do to help make it better. Again, renaming things is really hard, but if you have something in your wording saying, hey, we figured this was the best name we could come up with because here's why, if you can come up with something better that meets all these criteria, we'll look at it. Um, that makes people feel like they have more influence. And then figure out if you're going to handle finances, how all that's going to work, whose problem it's going to be. If it can be somebody else's problem, like Let's say your marketing is donated through a local agency, a uh, local news agency, and your space is donated through a university, and your pizza is donated through a company that wants to have a hand in it, and you don't have to handle money. That makes everything so much easier. Um, otherwise, figure out how that will work. Figure out if and how you can take monetary donations if you're going to need to, and so forth. So now we've got this structure in place, this foundation that we can set a pretty good program on. Then we're going to look harder at those users that you think you were targeting. Um, make sure they exist. Find a few of them, however you were planning on finding them for your uh, event, and talk to them. Ask them how they find out about cool new things to do. Ask them how much time they have to make sure that your assumptions about them were, um, weren't just totally off base. And at this point, when you're understanding your user group, it can help to just write down like, everybody in my program will have a computer. Everyone in my program will be available one night a week. And then challenge each of those assumptions, go, is this something we really need to have or is this something that we could work around? Like let's say by live streaming instead of expecting them to show up in person or something. Um, make sure that the only assumptions and expectations about your users are the ones that actually should be there rather than like, oh yeah, I'm going to assume that everyone can easily get to this part of the city that's dominated by this one group that isn't um, only our target audience or something. Um, 
And then once you have your users and you know basically their backgrounds and what they want to learn or what they think they want to learn, you can then start writing and organizing your curriculum. Put the interesting stuff, the stuff that motivates the stuff that they won't be interested in yet, near the beginning. Um, figure out what they'll need to know. Draw pictures, draw a graph of how all of the information depends on all the other information. And that graph will often show you a logical spot to jump in and start. Because um, as I said before, curriculum building has circular dependencies in it. My best fix that I've found for this is to just, the first time you hit something, rather than going off on a huge tangent about it, rather than just saying, here's a link to five days later in the documentation, go read it. Just give them the minimal summary that they could possibly have in order to get on with what's at hand. And then you can go back and revisit it in more detail later. So you'll notice in online documentations, like I've been trying to learn a new programming language lately and notice this a lot, rather than explaining a topic right, on, right off the bat, they'll just link to that topic later in the docs. But the thing they linked relies on you having finished that introductory section that you're currently working on. You can't do that when you're standing at the front of a room lecturing because there, there are no links. There's nowhere that they can either decide to click or not to click. Um, again, the best course is that minimum summary instead of the link and then a direction where you encourage them to go if they want to learn more, if that topic really grabs them right away. Um, and then you can point them at your later documentation, but be kind of wary of doing that because the later docs are going to assume that they know everything up till then. So you've got this curriculum more or less sorted out. This is when you can start really looking at your community resources and the volunteers who've offered you time and expertise. Figure out the things that they really care about, the things that they really enjoy, and um, ask them if they'll help you develop curriculum for or help you teach um, that particular unit on it. So one thing that can be helpful if you're working with really busy volunteers is have an extremely well-framed request for them. It's not, would you just help out here? They, they may run off from that being like, I don't have an extra n hours a week. It's, would you um, give me feedback on these slides of what y anything you think they're missing? And then to the other expert, would you um, draft the basic topics that people need to know about this? Something like that. Just break it up into little pieces, and you're more likely to get a yes from someone on that. Um, so you've got your volunteers. Some of them are willing to speak and present uh, particular lessons. You've got your users. You know more or less who they are. Now you need to know where do you want them all to show up. You can do it all live streamed, but we've found that getting feedback from the audience during a live stream doesn't seem to have an elegant solution. We've tried getting them on IRC. We've tried using the little chat feature of Google Hangouts. But in general, people don't seem to feel as engaged. Um, having everybody in a room lets them ask questions, lets them whisper to their neighbor, lets you point at their screen, and just uh, is such a higher bandwidth communication that it's uh, much better. So when you're, when you're picking your time and place, it's not only based on who can share a place with you, but your target users. What else are they doing? Are they all of a religion that says, you need to be doing this thing on this day of the week? Don't schedule it on that day of the week, or they won't be able to show up. Um, if it's at a time that would be a meal time for most of them, see if you can't get somebody to sponsor food. And in doing that, see if you can't include like some healthy-ish options and um, deal with any dietary restrictions as well, if possible. Um, and again, review the assumptions that you've made about your users. Um, let's say we're having an event here. You're assuming that they either have a car, live within walking distance, or this happened, or have enough time to work with the bus time. So maybe you can schedule it at a time where they can just take a bus in and then take a convenient bus out and not be stuck for an extra hour on campus. Um, are you assuming that they don't have kids and won't need childcare, or can a volunteer like potentially help provide childcare if a massive portion of your users would go, yeah, I'd love to do that, but I can't find anybody to watch my kid. I mean, figure out what particular needs they have. Like, our university students need to not have any extra requests placed on them at midterms and finals. It's just how life is for them. And then be understanding of those in order to keep your people engaged. So now that you've got a time and a place to tell people to show up to, you've got to tell them to show up. Um, you can do a little bit of advertisement before you've figured out where it'll be, just to kind of gauge interest, get a better metric of who will be around. But on the whole, 
you want to do the most of this once, you've, once you can train people on one time, one place, one how often it recurs, just say always be there. Changing times and changing places and getting the word out to everybody is a surprisingly hard problem, as I learned with Linux users groups. Um, so back when you identified your audience, you looked at how they find things that they think it would be cool to do. Do they see magazine ads? Do they see um, posters in the hallways at school? Do they hear about it from their friends on some email list? I mean, figure out what will reach the people you're targeting and then communicate there. Um, if it's through, let's say, a school email list, then you reach out, you find out from a user who runs that school email list, you reach out to them and explain how promoting your thing would accomplish some of their goals. Like, let's say they pride themselves on being a school that has lots of cool activities for people. Then you're like, hey, you're a school with lots of cool activities. This is proof that you've got lots of cool activities. Feel good about yourself and post my thing. Um, rather than trying to like bully them into it or any of that, if it's possible. Um, so there might be user groups, there might be meetups, there might be places you can stick posters. Just um, figure that out from what your target audience already does. And when you advertise, don't just say, if you're interested, say, if you or anyone you know is interested, tell them about this cool thing. Because um, you'll get a lot of word of mouth recommendations, and often someone who might not have had the confidence to go, why, well, yes, I can learn computers all by themselves, if their friend goes, hey, look, you'd be really good at that, you should do that thing, is much likelier to show up. So once you've advertised this lesson coming up, you're like, and you have this curriculum, and you know who's going to be presenting it, you're like, oh, that's next week. I should probably get ready. Run through your talk a time or two. Run through any hands-on demos on the same computer that you're going to be presenting from. Have a newbie, have a friend or relative or somebody cooperative run through the demos you expect your audience to do on a computer it's never been set up on before. Because it's amazing the assumptions you can make about what you have installed, what errors they won't hit. And then hitting those errors when you're making it look easy can be really discouraging for a newbie. Um, if you're going to have a lot of hands-on content, make sure that you have enough volunteers around to assist people individually. Otherwise, it will take a really long time to get through your um, exercises. And you can have the speaker be you for the first few times, or it can be um, volunteers, either way. So then you go on to teaching. You've got this room full of people. It's the first day. What do you do? First lesson, make sure to give them a roadmap of where they're going, why they care, how their life is going to be more awesome when they know this stuff, and reassure them that they really can do it. Make sure you have a chance, either in public or maybe in private, to address whatever concerns they have about why they think they can't do it. And bear, bear those in mind as you refine the curriculum as you go along. Um, be clear on whether it's OK to join the program partway through. And keep it interactive. Keep people from being bored. Um, don't put your people to sleep like I'm kind of doing. I know it's day three of the conference. That's how it works. So once you've taught your first few lessons, continually refine them. Assess how it went, what was good, what was bad, what did we do that made it good or bad, how can we fix these in the future. Keep a checklist for before your lesson. Follow it every time and improve the checklist when, it's not very, uh, when you find a problem with it, rather than just disregarding it. Meet among whoever's organizing it to make sure that um, you share any feedback you've gotten from the group. Um, identify when you're going to need review days, because people will trickle in, and you are going to need to review and catch people up. And then make sure that people, if you're asking them to do something outside of class, really are having the time for that. And talk to your students about what you can do with those and what you can do with the support for those out of class exercises to make them more achievable. So then you just repeat. You keep doing it until they get bored or you get bored or you've taught them everything you wanted them to know. Um, every couple of months, assess your own state relative to the program. Make sure that the amount of work you're doing is actually sustainable. Check in with the supporters. See if it looks to them like they're achieving their goals or if there's something that they'd like you to do differently. And again, constantly refine those checklists that you go through, because they'll make handoffs so much easier. Um, I'm going to add in the step brag about it, not only because spreading the word gets you more supporters, more students, more impact, more success, but if you want job offers, if you want to be regarded as a national expert on the topic you're teaching, this is going to happen if your name is all over the site. I was really surprised when this happened to me. I got approached by a large company that I figured out partway through the like 
let's have a call with this vice president that, oh, I think they've mistaken me for a national expert on DevOps. This is neat. Let's see where this goes, kind of thing. And that eventually turned itself into a job offer. So if you're looking for those, um, they're available. Um, if you want to do consulting, it's a great like feather in your cap, especially if you want to do teaching. Um, if you're a super humble person, you don't want to derive any personal benefit from it, brag about it anyway. Brag about the accomplishments that your students are having. Brag about their success setting up a thing or troubleshooting a problem on their own or installing their first package to their package manager, whatever it is. It'll find you more supporters, um, make the community more aware of it. And word just kind of spreads in weird ways. And then people will be like, oh, I've heard of that. And people will come in who might not have found out about it through any of your advertising channels. And you'll get a wider base of people in. And um, that's generally good for everyone. And then eventually, you're probably going to run out of energy and time for this. I found that it was it would have been a burnout job if I would tried to do it for multiple years in a row. Um, partly because it was also on top of school. but. It's just a lot of responsibility to be orchestrating that and a lot of time and worry that you put in. So when you notice that it stopped making you happy, uh, or if you notice that you're starting to become kind of curmudgeonly, kind of grouchy, like, this is the fifth newbie that asked me that stupid question. Why don't you newbies just know this already? This is, no, seriously, this is why older, de uh, more established developers in a project are more likely to lose patience and be crabby at noobs. because. The old and newbies start blurring together when you do it for too long. And not, not to any of the individual newbies that I've taught, you guys are all awesome if you're watching this video. But um, just newbies, it's, it stops being, oh, this one problem needs a solution that I've, I've only solved a couple times. It's like, oh, they need this for the nth time. This is frustrating. So pay attention to yourself. When you start burning out on it, when you start losing that enthusiasm for, whoa, I've never solved this, let's do a boot camp problem before, this is shiny and new, uh, hand it off to someone newer and more enthusiastic. And if you do the handoff carefully, the program will survive just fine. You can keep being a resource to the program, keep being a mentor to the program without harming it by being grouchy at people who really, um, it's not their fault and it's not your fault, but you're likelier to be grouchy at them if you've done it for too long and don't have infinite patience. And the new leaders will benefit from leading it as well. Um, give them a job title and give them responsibility. And if they do it well, then suddenly they're a world expert in the topic too. So with that, um, I wish you all the best in whatever program you're trying to found. And I hope that finding out about ours is interesting or inspiring or something. Um, here's all of my information. Um, here's also the DevOps Bootcamp website right now and the organizers list if you have questions for the current organizers alias. Um, feel free to reach out to me or to them. And I'll be around at the conference for a little bit before I have to go catch my flight as well. Mm. Mm. Mm.